Barcelona, September 2020. A patient arrives to a large public hospital with symptoms compatible with cardiovascular disease. State of the art sophisticated image diagnostics and uh, testing methods are used to screen and stratify the patient condition, circumstances, and status. So the treatment to this patient includes advanced therapies after a biomarker-based assessment of the outcome or the response. So this could be a possible definition of personalized medicine. Welcome to this panel on personalized medicine included in the Bioregion 2020 presentation event. We will try to discern concepts and assess barriers and levels of adoption of personalized medicine globally, but also in Catalonia. We will discuss if personalized medicine is failing to deliver the transformation predicted, or on the contrary, is a perfect evolution dash revolution model in which a gradual fulfillment of goals with abrupt disruptions, like for example, why not the one that can be an outcome of these COVID pandemics, uh, is the model of choice. So I want to acknowledge Amgen, a leading global biotech company, and also EATRIS, the European infrastructure for translational medicine to make this event possible. Biocat is a partner of EATRIS in the Horizon 2020 funded consortium EATRIS Plus, a flagship project also devoted to personalized medicine. So this panel is also an activity of this uh, project, a European funded project. Now my role here is to introduce you the speakers moderate their discussion and invite you to stay with us for the, for the next 40 minutes. And I also encourage you to answer to the same questions that will be asked to the panelists. So they will elaborate their choices and you will be able to contrast yours and theirs at the end of each question and also at the end of the session. So remember the procedure to vote. It was explained in the previous part. There's a special area uh, in the bottom uh, right part of your or your uh, screen, and then just no brainer. Please choose there an option, and that then the question when the question is asked, and then we will see the responses. So, without further explanations, I would like to introduce you our distinguished speakers of today and thank them for their participation. This is Fina Yados. She is general manager of Amgen Iberia. She is a recognized C-level corporate woman with a sound history in the biotechnology industry. Now, not here, but connected, they will be participating. Dr. Antonio Andreu, his scientific director of Eatris Eric, specialized in genetics and genomics of rare diseases, and a valued professional also in the field of policy making. So he's been holding positions for the Spanish and the Catalan ministries of health. Dr. Enriqueta Felipe, she's head of thoracic cancer unit of Valdebron University Hospital, and one of the world top oncologists listed among the global highly cited researchers. And Mr. Edwin Van den Kettering is Clinical Project Director of Eatris. He uh, started working in clinical trials more than 20 years ago with a desire of bringing new and better treatments to patients and quicker. So thank you all of you to be here with us and also those who are connected to attend to this uh, table on personalized medicine. So now moving to the first question on that subject. And remember, I will ask the questions and we will expect your voting on that regard. Assuming that there's still a road to go from our state of the art and personalized medicine, here comes the first question to the public and to the panel. Um, and assuming, of course, that there are strategies in each country for this personalized medicine. Question number one, are European healthcare systems closed, prepared or closed to adopt their personalized medicine strategies? This is a yes, no answer, no brainers and no in-betweens, as this would be the choice. If I could give you an in-between, that would be the choice of 90% of the people. So just yes or not. And we see here, yes, so no, no, sorry. I made my mistake, it's not really excellent, so no. Um, while the public votes, which uh, is already done, this is for the panelists. You will elaborate your answer and explain your contribution to PM and also the one from your institutions uh, and from your organizations to the personalized medicine deployment. So, um, Fina, which is your position on that subject? Yeah, uh, we have three positions. Uh, discover, develop, and uh, deliver transformative medicines for uh, the, uh, very serious diseases. Uh, we started as a company 40 years ago. We have a uh, year in Spain, the 30th anniversary this year. Uh, we set up our headquarters in Barcelona 30 years ago. And if we get back to the US, uh, our company was funded by two molecular biologists that strongly believe that biotechnology was the future of uh, medici medicine. 
Uh, we started on making, uh, we st started our story, uh, making sure that uh, we work uh, and we thought that our emerging genetic research could lead to uh, promising future therapies if we were able to uh, put together the smarter scientists in the world together with the right resources. Uh, we have working with our clear goals and since there we have been creating a very individualized approach of uh, their treating the patients and understanding very well the genetic and the genomic expressions, lifestyle of patients that also informs and contributes to the diseases. Uh, with that, uh, when we look to the next wave uh, future of therapies, we also want to make sure that we empower our scientists and doctors to think about their and go beyond uh, more and thinking that not anymore uh, once it's and thinking about uh, getting into a more precise medicine. Uh, we focus on therapies that uh, are very serious and uh, we are at Amgen using our key three strengths. So the way we contribute to their personalized medicine are based in the three strengths that we have in the company. The uh, first is human genetics, the second is molecular engineering, and the third is pathway biology. If I talk about human genetics, in 2012, already Amgen has set up a very clear view that we need to focus our research and development uh, taking into account their genetics as a basis. Uh, we bought a company from Iceland, that is the boat, uh, where we have been able to get a, a bank of genetic of their uh, population to very well understand and correlate genetics uh, with diseases and allowing uh, also to validate therapies uh, on our side. Uh, on the molecular engineering, when we think about a pathology, we always think what's the need that we have in, in, uh, for a, a therapy and, and what uh, where we have gaps in, in, in biology. And uh, Amgen also has one of the largest modality toolkits in, uh, in our site that allows to adapt the thing that we can solve with the appropriate platform. So to give you an example, when we need to solve a disease, we use our plat 12 different platforms and we use uh, uh, car -Ts, we use uh, antibodies, antibodies, we we have uh, peptides, making sure that we first understand the disease and after And last but not least, the pathway biology. If we are able to integrate the human genetics with understanding the pathology, uh, we would be successful in getting new therapies. To give you an example, uh, currently we have 25 uh, molecules in, in oncology portfolio and 13 of those have a myomarker. So this means that we are already kind of using a, a very uh, link uh, biology and personalized medicine to solve the problems. We have also uh, other challenges and when we think about personalized medicine, we need also to approach differently the clinical research. I'm sure, I'm sure Dr. Philip will address also that, how we design the clinical trials, but also uh, we need to look at the strategies. And we also work together with the authorities uh, in three areas. One is applying modeling and simulating uh, different uh, clinical trials. Uh, in our uh, clinical trials now, 80% of our clinical trials use this um, statistical methodology. With this, uh, we design different studies and, and di uh, using different variables to understand when we will get uh, the impact there and, and just to get uh, much faster development. The second piece also is using, as an example, adaptive clinical trials. When we are working in a much narrow population, which is not mer anymore a big size of, of, of patients, uh, we need to make sure that we understand the data that it's getting online and we adapt the clinical trials uh, accordingly online. And the last piece using also the real world evidence. We need to make sure that we understand what's uh, happening in clinical practice to inform the future uh, strategies. Um, just a couple of points that w I want to make at the end. I think, I think the personalized med medicine is also very necessary that it's very well understood by the society. 
if we want to be a reference uh, here in Catalonia as a reference in the world for their personalized medicine, we need to also emphasize the work on the public and private sector and to use uh, nicely their ex ecosystem that we have and making sure that we are successful and, and being the leaders uh, worldwide uh, and also we need also to the public system to be proactive on that and getting also some fundings that are now coming from the European Union. So I think we have a lot of work to do, but also a great opportunity for the future. You said a lot of things. I was just um, highlighting some of them, figures. You, you also answered some questions for the, you know, the, 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 the road ahead. So now, Tony, um, the floor is yours also for the same question. Your contribution, your, your organization's contribution, some um, cases of good examples that you can add and some um, contribution to all this uh, question of personalized medicine. To be here and sharing this day with, with my Catalan friends, yeah. So uh, I represent Teatris and I think Teatris is one uh, organization that perfectly uh, reflects the challenges and the opportunities that we have in the European landscape. Teatris is a research infrastructure uh, created by European Commission about 10 years ago. It represents the shared effort of 13 European countries that decided to take this journey together. And uh, we have a network of approximately 120 biomedical research institutions that work in the field of translational medicine, from basic research to university clinical, clinical hospitals. The Spanish and the Catalan community is very active in Atris, and actually it's one Catalan institution the Valle Brown Institute of Research, the one that is leading the entire presence, not only of the Catalan, but also the entire uh, Spanish scientific community. Three years ago, uh, it became very clear to us that personalized medicine was the great opportunity uh, for uh, you know, showing that the transformation is possible. And I like uh, what you mentioned, Monse, because we are talking not about the revolution, we are talking about an evolution of uh, our uh, scientific or scientific landscape. So um, we decided to, to, to use the capacities that we have with this idea of uh, creating a common space of cooperation by which the different scientific and technological teams will work together to develop tools that will be used for the development uh, and the implementation of personalized medicine. Uh, understanding the personalized medicine is the, this big challenge by which we will be able to give you know, the, the right treatment to the right patient at the right time with the right dose. So uh, the, 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 the activity that better exemplifies this effort on personalized medicine, and I'm pretty sure that Edwin, my colleague, will give you more examples, is Atris Plus, is this, um, is this uh, flagship project that you mentioned, funded by the European Commission, it started this year for two years, where 13, uh, the 13 different European countries will uh, work together to develop novel tools for the progress of personalized medicine. And our perspective is to try to move beyond the concept of genomic medicine, because personalized medicine has advanced enormously, and Enriqueta is a beautiful example of the scientific community in the field of oncology, also in the field of rare diseases, but other areas of medicine are still far away. And uh, one reason is because uh, um, the development of personalized medicine had a lot to do with the development of genomic medicine, but the complexity of the biochemistry of the entire biology of the human disease goes beyond the genomic knowledge. And in Atris Plus, we want to integrate and develop tools for developing a more multiomic-based approach, trying to integrate uh, highly uh, reliable and efficient biomarkers that represent multi-signatures coming from the individual signatures that represent genomic, proteomic, multiomic, and metabolomic uh, signatures of one individual, one individual patient. Uh, the key element of uh, what we're trying to do is high quality and high reproducibility, because if you want to use a very targeted, patient-targeted biomarker for uh, a diagnosis of therapy, you, you have to make sure that this biomarker, this individual biomarker, is going to be, is going to be efficient. And uh, this process of validation is, is really complex, really difficult, and only can be done through scientific cooperation. And a second part, what we are trying to do, a part of developing these uh, technology-based tools, is to create 
a common mindset, a common mind space where the different stakeholders will collaborate together. Because uh, as it has been said before, the development of personalized medicine cannot come only from the academia or from the scientific community. We need the industry. We desperately need the uh, uh, knowledge that comes from the industry. We need also the policy makers. We need the patient community. And only if we are able to put all this knowledge together on, we will be able to create these tools that will accelerate the process of development and, and, and adoption. And the last but not the least, I want to emphasize that when in, uh, in Amsterdam, where the headquarters of Theatris uh, are located, we uh, were designing the project and it became very evident that we need the industry perspective. Uh, it was very, very clear that BioCat and the Catalan Bio, Bio region will represent just the perfect partner. So I also want to take the opportunity of having this meeting also, Enriqueta, for expressing our, you know, our um, happiness that having uh, BioCat on board. the sound. Tony, we couldn't hear you the last words. Um, so, but thank you for your words as well. Um, I'm happy to, to hear that. Um, so, um, is, it, is it okay if we just move to the next uh, speaker? I don't know if he had some else to, 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 to tell, but anyway. Uh, so, thank you. I just was writing down also your, your, your comments and more or less you both answered the question if the health systems are or not prepared because there's still a way to go but you have some contributions important contributions and identified where where, where some things are lacking so uh, no, sorry it was my <laughs> sorry oops now um enriqueta so the floor is yours <laughs> Thank you. So in oncology, there are uh, a number of lines of investigation that include uh, prevention, early detection, and also the discovery of vulnerabilities in the tumor of each patient to give individualized strategies. So clearly, individualized strategies, precision medicine are key in uh, oncology uh, uh, treatment. So I'm a medical oncologist uh, working in a hospital in Barcelona, uh, in uh, area of Catalonia, and at the oncology department, every year we have seen more than 5,000 new patients with cancer and more than 3,500 will need systemic therapy. So in the past, we used to treat these patients according to the location of the disease, lung cancer, breast cancer, or colon cancer, with surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. But in the last decade, we have uh, uh, added also molecular markers. So for patients with cancer, uh, precision medicine is a reality. For patients with uh, breast cancer, we need the HER2 status or know some genomic uh, uh, alterations to know the risk of recurrence. For patients with colon cancer, we need to know the status of RAS. For patients with lung cancer, before starting treatment, we test for HFR mutation, ALK, and ROS rearrangement for patients with melanoma also test for VRAF mutation. We have also learned that there are molecular alterations, for, for example, N-track fusions, and we can see these alterations in different tumor types, and also irrespective of ages, there are also these alterations in pediatric uh, population. So now we have drugs approved for patients with a molecular alterations irrespective of the tumor type and also the uh, age. So yes, we, we need these uh, determinations and we are doing determinations in our patients with, uh, uh, in tumor tissue and also in liquid biopsy. So it's not a longer an ambition, it's a reality. From an uh, investigational perspective, at uh, Valdebron Institute of Oncology, we have different groups. We have more preclinical groups, uh, translational groups, and also uh, clinical groups uh, working uh, together. But our lemma is uh, translational research towards a precision medicine. And we are organized as a, a task force. We have the task force for uh, colorectal cancer, for prostate, for uh, breast cancer, for lung cancer, and we are working in a multidisciplinary way all together. We have regular uh, meetings, we discuss the investigation, and also we have uh, some central cores that are really important, that are the molecular pathology unit, the genomic unit, and also uh, proteomics. So we have built also at Valdebron Institute of Oncology a strong program in clinical trials. So uh, uh, last year we had uh, open for uh, inclusion more than 600 clinical trials in oncology and we have included more than 1,200 patients. 
And this year, even with the COVID pandemic at uh, the end of August, we uh, included uh, more than uh, 650 patients in clinical trials. So our, uh, when we have a patient that is a potential candidate for a clinical trial and the patient agree on that, we test the tumor uh, using our platform, the NGS platform in the tumor or even in the liquid biopsy. And if the patient has a molecular alteration, a mutation, an increased copy number alteration, a fission, or uh, an amplification, we discuss the results in our molecular tumor board, and we try to uh, allocate this patient to a clinical trial that is the more uh, rational based on the molecular alteration that we have found in the tumor. So again, in the last, uh, this uh, allow us to uh, participate in clinical trials that uh, have uh, led to the approval of drugs by FDA and also EMA. In cancer, also, immunotherapy is crucial now, so it's a, a relevant strategy for the treatment in our patients. But we also know that there are patients that are not benefited from immunotherapy, and we need also to work uh, uh, on that uh, line of investigation. There are the so-called uh, cold tumors, not inflamed, and we need to inflame these tumors to be recognized by the immunotherapy strategy. So again, there is a clear need of personalized therapy in the immunotherapy <coughs> setting. And the patients receive treatment and, uh, in the standard of care and also in clinical trials, but progress. And we need also to re-biopsy these tumors to analyze, to define the mechanisms of acquired resistance in order to uh, have drugs to, to target and also to delay the, the, the presence. So, uh, and I would like to thank the patients and, uh, for, and the relatives for all the commitment. But I think, uh, yes, at least the health uh, European system is now understanding the relevance of a strategies uh, in personalized uh, tre uh, treatments. So thank you very much, Enriqueta, for your um, examples and also for the, 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 the diagnosis of what needs to be done for the health systems. So uh, Edwin, which will be your answer to this question? Yes, thank you, Monse, and good morning, everybody. Um, my answer to this question would be um, yes, and also, no, I do think we are closer, but I don't think we are close. Um, and it also depends on the disease in question. Um, just to uh, expand on that, I work on a project called EU Pearl. And this is short for uh, European Patient-Centric Platform Trials, which is a public-private collaboration uh, project funded by the Innovative Medicines Initiative, or IMI. Um, and Eatris is the co-coordinator of the uh, of the project. Um, the aim of EU Pearl is to establish a framework for the conduct of platform clinical trials, and um, designed with the patient in mind. So, in addition to this framework, we are also designing four different clinical trials: um, one for major depressive disorder, one for NASH, one for tuberculosis, and one for tuberculosis. Uh, um, and what makes a platform clinical trial different from a normal clinical trial? In a, in a normal clinical trial, you usually have um, a placebo arm or a control arm, and you test uh, an investigational compound in the other arm. Um, well, in a platform trial, um, you ideally have a common placebo arm or control arm, and you test multiple different compounds, so multiple different arms in, uh, in that same platform. Um, which um, would then, uh, those arms, those compounds come from multiple different pharmaceutical companies. So this makes the platform a more collaborative setting than your normal clinical trial. Um, it would also allow from a personalized medicine perspective in clinical research to investigate new biomarkers or even randomize patients based on their specific biomarker to a specific treatment arm. For example, a, a patient with biomarker A could either could be randomized to control or to R1 or R2, while patients with biomarker B could be randomized to control or R3 or 4. This is then important because it would bring the research into personalized medicine closer to the patients than it currently is um, compared to your normal clinical trial, because in those normal clinical trials, the biomarker um, is often 
uh, a nice to have or more of an afterthought um, and not a main uh, topic of investigation. Then if you look at the Address Plus project that Tony mentioned, that toolbox that is being developed uh, for biomarkers and multiomics, that would then, that toolbox would be uh, very useful later on for platform trials like the ones EU Pearl is designing, because those tools could then help better tailored treatments being researched in clinical trials. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Edwin. Thank you. Um, um, you had still some more uh, minutes to go, but thank you for that because that helped us to move faster. Um, just uh, really quickly, uh, as a headlines, the, the answer for the public from the public and the panelists is not yet, uh, but we are evolving, like uh, Tony said. Um, but we need some actions to be taken, and we also provide some nice examples on how is uh, being put in place now. So um, now we move to the next subject. The personalized medicine international market is growing and is expected to reach 3.18 uh, trillion uh, dollars by 2025. So those are data reported before the pandemics that may change, of course. But despite some experts point out that it's failing to deliver the transformation predicted. So we agree that a coordinated, decided, and actionable collaborative strategy is the answer to any sustainable implementation of personalized medicine. One of the active agents contributing to pave this way is ICPERMED. So this is an international consortium for personalized medicine that brings together more than 40 funding bodies from EU member states and beyond. And according to ICPERMED 2030 vision, it is defined consulting international and European experts, uh, the pillars that sustain personalized medicine are four for, to advance on that regard. One, data and technology. This is, for example, electronic health record generation and availability involving ICT, omic advancement, etc. So data and technology. Two, um, intersectorial synergies. This means between healthcare research environment, uh, also with new business models. Three, healthcare systems reforms. We go there. <laughs> Sustainability, tension between uh, individual and collective health, very important, data sharing and governance issues. And four, education digital literacy, professional skills, citizen scientific literacy. So the question for the public and the speakers is, where should we influence to move forward? Remember, one, data, two, synergies between sectors, three, healthcare system reforms, four, education. Which one would you choose? Would you choose sorry? And meanwhile, just for the speakers, you will have to elaborate in two, three minutes your answer as well. So please be aware that there are journalists around. So please provide a headline. You know that how treacherous archives are. So that means that even 2030, we're not much ahead. We will come after you and hold you account for that. So please, uh, we will start now with Tony. We will change the order. So Tony, please. So this is the voting, right? Uh, still going on. Yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. Sorry. Okay. For my timing. So, uh, yeah, I don't see the I don't see the voting, but I'm going to um, to put on the on the table my own vote. Oh, yeah. Because uh, yeah, okay, I see. It. So 56 percent uh, of the audience or 55 puts up the as a priority the healthcare reforms. I think it's very interesting that IC Permet identify these four pillars as the kind of the main uh, opportunities, challenges and opportunities for the development and uh, adoption of a global personalized medicine agenda. So actually, I would like to say that I think this is, uh, I would like to use the analogy of a table because it's, this is like a table that has four legs. If you remove one of the legs, the table is going to fall apart. I don't think we should we should understand that this uh, requires personalized medicine, a complete re-engineering of the system. And I think what the audience is uh, saying, putting as a priority healthcare reforms, somehow is embracing all the other elements, like creating a data space or, um, uh, you know, or uh, creating a landscape where synergies will be, will be created. Um, we have to think about reverse engineering because although science uh, and I think oncology is just the perfect example, science is uh, providing uh, you know uh, big tools for the progress of personalized medicine, identifying targeting biomarkers, 
that um, allow clinical oncologists to give the right time, the right in at the right time. It is true that, for instance, there are issues about equity and accessibility to some of the resources uh, that are necessary for providing this treatment. So we need to, uh, um, you know, tackle directly the agenda of the policymakers who are the responsibles at the end of the day of a structure in the healthcare system. And this has to be done through a cooperation of the entire uh, group of stakeholders that participate in the process. So academia, industry, the patient community, and the policymakers we have to work together to identify the best way to move, to move forward. Because I think it's very important that we understand that the policymakers have this mental barrier thinking that personalized medicine is expensive. I would like to say that it's not expensive, it's efficient. And it's one um, perfect paradigm that can show us that when you invest at the right moment with the right target, the rewarding can be really, really possible. So I think the, the change is happening. Um, we still need to progress, but we need to harmonize our language and convince all together policymakers that uh, they can come with us in this in this journey. Well, thank you, Bonnie. That was um, really interesting because you kind of touched every every one of those subjects. So now, please, um, Enriqueta, can you tell us your perspective on that? Yes, thank you. Um, so I think the four pillars are important, but probably I will choose increasing uh, synergies among the different uh, uh, stakeholders. Uh, when I imagine a program of uh, a successful program of personalized medicine in cancer, we need a strong with a high quality press screening molecular uh, group. So we need uh, research, uh, bioinformatics, biologists involved and the healthcare uh, system. We need also a standard of, uh, of care consultation uh, between uh, the physician and the patient. So to explain the results of the molecular alteration, to give the patient available treatment options or clinical trials. So we have here also the health care patients that are really important and the pharma because the pharma is doing a lot in developing drugs in, in a small subset of patients and also to give to the patients the possibility to access to these uh, agents. We need also probably um, uh, a registry. We need to know exactly what is happening in our patients, so uh, have the registry to know the molecular alteration, the evolution. Even the FDA has opened the possibility to approve drugs in uncommon molecular alterations based on registries. So we need, again, here people uh, that are expert in big data and also to analyze the information. And finally, we, uh, we need also reimbursement and cost issues. So we need, again, the health system and the payer. So yes, I think for me, increasing synergies probably is the first step in this, uh, in this uh, yes, adventure. Excellent. I think this is what we are trying also to do that, just um, mixing people from different uh, professionals or institutional origins to discuss about that. So um, uh, Fina, uh, which is your option from these pillars? Yeah, all four are important, as so all have said that uh, if I need to choose one, perhaps intersectoral uh, collaboration is very, very important. I think uh, it's uh, personalized medicine, it's more and more a very diverse need of different experts and different uh, knowledge, and I think there, uh, I think all alone we are we go nowhere and I think that's that's a critical path uh, to be successful and um, also if I think to highlight something of course the data is very important so we need to make sure that we have the data to just get uh, enough information uh, but also I think informing uh, their society and understanding their importance of personalized medicine which is more to the uh, point number four I think if we get our society and patients and we as a society, we are future patients. If we well understand how important is their personalized medicine and making sure that we uh, just push for getting the best treatments uh, in a very efficient way, I think as a consequence, our healthcare will get a, a right reform. So I think the four pillars are very well chosen. Well, thank you. That means also that um, the, um, one of the choices that uh, was exposed here is not um, expensive, is efficient. That could be also something that we can um, um, reach out to, to society in, in those terms. So uh, now I think it's uh, Edwin. Uh, can you, will you 
you know, it's a difficult question uh, if you dare to stick your neck out on that since you're um, away from here. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to stick my neck out. Um, and I have to agree first that all four, the, all four pil pillars are important to make that vision a re reality. Um, and I would actually emphasize uh, two. First, the data and technology, because you need it across all of the sectors, which means healthcare reform, and education, etc. Um, but just on the on the data, uh, many or nearly all the hospitals have electronic health systems with electronic health records by now, um, and they are either developed by the hospitals themselves or using software packages from companies or a combination thereof. Um, but they are all very different. Even within uh, the same country, hospitals use different systems. Um, that's not a problem in and of itself, but the challenge is that the data in those systems isn't harmonized. It's not in the same format or it's not coded the same way, which then means that you cannot combine it into larger data sets that you really need for, uh, for research. Um, so I would first urge everybody to support projects like the IMI Eden project, which aims to standardize electronic health records in Europe. Uh, as well support standardization of uh, biomarkers and multiomics data. Um, and if you are interested, there's a project website for Eden uh, where you can even apply for grants as a hospital to get your system standardized. Um, and the second one I would want to stress is education because using this new data, new systems is going to require the people who currently work in, in healthcare, for example, to be retrained and upskilled um, to use that um, in 2030 when I see what vision uh, should uh, be reality. Um, but also everybody who's in school now and goes to work in that industry or in, in uh, caregiving in 2030, they need to have that in their core cur curriculum now uh, in order to be ready by that time. Um, and education and training is often considered too late in these kind of projects. Uh, so I'm glad to see that in IC Permit they've put it now as one of the core pillars because they need to tackle it now already so that it can be used 10 years from now. So I'm very happy uh, that it's one of those pillars as well. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, Edwin. Uh, to one of you gave good reasons for any of, uh, of those four pillars. I think that uh, much work is needed to, do, to be done on, on, on either four, but uh, the public chose um, healthcare reforms, so there's a way ahead on that regard also, but like you said, intersectorial synergies like FINA said, or the um, healthcare records, data, um, and, and also um, society and patient um, education or literacy or or more knowledge on that on that area. So uh, now, uh, about one year ago, the top, this is the last area, last question on that table. One year ago, the top therapeutic area for personalized medicine was oncology. I think you po probably agree with that since it's uh, in, in, in the reports and followed by cardiovascular diseases, neurodegenerative, etc. So now the speed and ferocity of COVID-19 pandemic and the enormous variability in the course and severity of the disease may have challenged these expectations. Um, so the question for the panel, and there's no question for the public, the question for the, for the panel is how has COVID-19 affected the personalized medicine roadmap, either because the research researchers resources have been derived to this area or because COVID has displaced oncology as the paradigm area. And I need just one minute one minute from each of you to answer to this question. Just one minute. Who, who starts? I mean, there's no an order for that now. Who wants to start? I can start if you want, Monse. Yeah. Uh, I think what I would like to say is I think uh, COVID-19 is the perfect example of the personalized medicine paradigm and the importance of personalized medicine. Because the big question here uh, is why a 95-year-old person uh, suffering from a chronic and cardiac, uh, cardiac and pulmonary condition with lots of comorbidities when infected do not show any symptomatology? Why a 25-year-old male or female is well-nourished and healthy develops this uh, terrible cytokine storm and eventually, eventually dies? This has to do, of course, with the individual signatures of the biology of these two individuals basically with that particular signature which is developed through life which is our immune profile our immune system so this is the moment 
to show that now we should be able to go deeper into science, go deeper into our understanding of the individual characteristics of the different you know, diseases to prove that personalized medicine is the way to move, to move forward and provide the COVID-19. Uh, you, you can see that obviously during 2021, uh, this is going to be probably the big challenge, go deeper into the understanding of the biology of the complications of the disease and the long-term consequences, consequences of the disease. Thank you, Tony. I don't know if, I mean, uh, we are really out of time, so uh, unless some of you want to just uh, add something, uh, probably we can get this idea. Um, any other of you want to add something? Uh, although, I mean, we are really, uh, so please stay us for the Alex Casta Awards for Best Startup Pitch, and they will start in a very a short, short, short break, and you'll not regret uh, following next session. It will be enriching. Thank you, everybody. We are in the BioRegional uh, Report presentation in the Barcelona Science Park. Thank you for your attendance, and thank you to the speakers and uh, organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.